Thank you, Greg. Uh, I'm introducing uh, Bryony Hume, who's our, uh, our speaking to us today. Now, Bryony is um, one of those rare people who has survived and thrived in the broadcast industry for over three decades. And not only that, but she's done it from Adelaide. So, uh, fantastic effort, Bryony. Well done. Uh, Bryony's worked as a reporter producer, presenter and chief of staff at Channel 7 and you can currently see her weekly on Channel 7 presenting for the lifestyle program SA Weekender. Brony became associated with the Sunrise Children's Association in 2009 and today she's speaking to us today on the topic of help without harm, the challenges of volunteerism. Brony. Oh, thank you, Brenton. Thank you, Greg. Thank you all for uh, having me here today. It is a privilege to be able to share some of the work of Sunrise with you. I don't know about surviving for, and thriving for three decades in the broadcasting. I think I've just hidden in a corner for long enough that, that I've managed to escape the carnage that otherwise goes on, but it has been a terrific 30 years. I know when it comes to helping uh, children in the developing world, I am actually preaching to the choir here. I've been reading a little bit, a bit about Adelaide Rotary's involvement in projects in the Philippines, Northwest China, Sri Lanka, the Pacific region, and I believe even some books have made their way to Nepal thanks to this group here. So you're clearly well engaged in some of the issues I'm going to be talking about today. In a moment, I have a little video to show you if I don't stuff up the audiovisual. Um, to illustrate where SCAI is focusing its uh, work at the moment and then I want to tell you the story of how we got to where we are and what part volunteering pl plays in that for better and for worse. So wish me luck, I'm going to push the button. No, I've screwed it up. <laughs> I ah. thank you, Reg. Perfect, thank you. Oh, I think we seem to have it in fast plays. There's something we can do about that, Reg? Slowly, if we may. Anyway, let's proceed. You just have to read the subtitles first.
There you go. I've never seen a woman groom a cow so fast. <laughs> so our founder, who you would have seen, our founder, who you would have seen in that video, Emma Taylor, was in her early 30s and working in the advertising industry in 2004 or thereabouts when on a vacation in Nepal she decided to do some volunteering. Sounded like a great idea, she picked an orphanage. But what she found at that orphanage appalled her. The children were undernourished, they weren't being sent to school, they were being kept in filthy conditions and she even witnessed one severely disabled boy who was continually tied to his chair because there was no one who could manage him for extended periods. Nonetheless, she stuck it out. She stayed and volunteered that, at that orphanage off and on for a couple of months, mainly comforting the children, playing with them, trying to, to give them some care. The owners of that home were clearly corrupt and thankfully have since been shut down. Emma was with two other Australian volunteers at that time and in what can only be described as a very, very ballsy move, the three they decided that they had to do something better for these children. So they decided they would start their own home and do it properly. Emma returned to Australia and she spent many months reorganising her life so that she could live in Nepal full time, where she rented premises and set about creating what was later to become Sunrise Children's Association. She even managed to reconnect with some of the children from that original orphanage and began caring for them as well. And so with just a handful of kids and a whole bunch of guts or insanity, the seeds of sunrise were, were, uh, were sown. It's gone on to become a fully fledged international non-government organisation, an INGO as they're known in the trade, working with Nepali partner organisations and the Nepali government to deliver its programs. So by the time I found my way to Nepal 10 years ago, undergoing something of a midlife crisis, I guess, wanting to be useful, um, I was on my way to volunteer for Sunrise as well and to make little movies to help them fundraise. Uh, when I got there, there were more than 70 children under one roof in still invented premises. Let's call it vibrant. It was certainly a lively atmosphere. I've done some travelling to pretty challenging places in my time. I've travelled across Burkina Faso in a train. Not a good idea. I've slept on the roof of a taxi by the side of the road in Senegal. Also not a good idea, but better than snake bite. And I've done a bit of voodoo in the Ivory Coast. Um, I got out alive, but uh, that's more than I can say for the chickens who were involved in the process. A bit messy. But nothing prepared me for the culture shock of living with 72 very energetic kids and their carers in Nepal. They barely spoke any English. I spoke no Nepali. And you know how kids always bring home colds from childcare and kindy? There was a lot of snot, and a lot of it was mine. But they were just joyous and inspiring kids. They were amazing. They couldn't believe that I was incapable of eating rice and curry with, with, with my bare hands. They could all do it. They scrutinised with intense interest and derision my underwear as I hung it on the line to dry. They couldn't understand why I had a boy's haircut and they could not understand where my husband was. It's amazing how people who don't share the same language of you as you can still mount an FBI grade interrogation somehow. I think they suspected my husband didn't actually exist because of the haircut and the bizarre underwear, but anyway, I'll never know. But they were and are delightful, generous, loving, curious children. And nowadays, we provide residential care for less than half that number of kids at our home, and I'll explain why shortly. My first night there, in what was then called an orphanage, I cried myself to sleep because it was just confronting. By the time I left, a month later, I cried myself to sleep again because I just didn't want to leave. I was hooked, I still am. I've been back and forth to Nepal six times in the duration, and it is a joy to have watched those children grow from little tackers into students who are studying engineering, social work, accountancy, nursing. They are amazing and resilient. So we've become used to the concept of 
orphans in developing countries. It's not a word that you hear in Australia much anymore. And it might seem logical that there would be more orphans living in countries where living standards are so atrocious. But in 2015, UNICEF estimated that there were 16,000 children in orphanages in Nepal, and it's thought that only about 85%, or in fact, 85% of them have one living parent or at least a very close adult relative. So they're not truly orphans. What are they doing there? Nepal has the magnificence of the Himalayas, but it has not a lot else that the rest of the world wants. It has 29 million people, and a quarter of them live on less than 50 cents a day. So imagine poverty so crippling, so grinding, in a remote rural village, no school, no jobs except for subsistence agriculture, like you saw on the screen before. And somehow it seems better to send your child away to the city so at least they may have a chance at a job and an education and decent food. The intent is good, but the reality is far from it. And imagine how confusing, heartbreaking and terrifying that is for the child who was sent away. Thousands of families in rural Nepal are forced into the situation. Often they pay what little money they do have to a middleman, a, fr a friend of a friend who promises to take the child to Kathmandu, put it in a good school, take care of it. But these people are essentially traffickers and they on-sell the children to corrupt orphanage owners who then use the children as human bait. They attract donations from well-meaning foreigners or international comp uh, corporations, but they have no intention of providing proper care for the children. That's the kind of orphanage that Emma found herself faced with when first she came to Nepal. There are other reasons. It's not that simple. Sometimes if a woman remarries, her new partner won't accept the children from the former marriage, and the child might be passed from relative to relative, eventually ending up in some sort of home. Sometimes girls are trafficked uh, for the sex trade all the way to India. Many children end up in brick factories or as domestic labourers. Um, some children simply become separated from their families, either during the decade-long civil war that Nepal had that only ended about 10 years ago, uh, but largely went unnoticed by the rest of the world, um, or in natural disasters like the, the 2015 um, earthquake, which, which had horrific implications for many poor people. They may have been sent to, to safer places at the time, but never managed to reconnect with their families. Nepal just doesn't have the systems or the money to look after those who fall through the cracks, and corruption is rife. And that's how we came to a situation where there were 16,000 children in homes in Nepal, for all the wrong reasons. Across the world, it's estimated that that figure might be somewhere around 8 million children, with four out of five of them having a family member who could, with a little support, care for that child. So it's not surprising that we want to help all these kids, and volunteerism seems like a great idea. I used to think so. That's why I got involved. It is a modern phenomenon. And in fact, about half of Australia's universities have some sort of affiliation with a volunteerism project. Thankfully, not more, not very many with orphanages anymore. But this does create a bigger problem, a market for orphans. So you have a busload of enthusiastic Western helpers who part with lots of cash, allegedly to be used for food and supplies um, uh, for the children. And they come and spend a week or two or perhaps a month bonding with the kids and then they leave never to return again, leaving the children feeling abandoned over and over again. And leaving the orphanage owners with no reason to search for the children's real families because they've got a bunch of little cash cows. That's essentially how they treat them. The research is damning. A longitudinal study in Romania, which has an infamous history of substandard child institutions, have found that the effects of poor quality uh, care on very young children can uh, lead to the same sort of effects as severe malnutrition, lead poisoning, and drug use in utero. And once these, once these children are sent out into the wider world, they have higher rates of homelessness, aggression, unemployment, and suicide. 
volunteerism has undoubtedly increased the proliferation of orphanages, although it's very hard to quantify because so many are unregistered and pop up and disappear somewhere and reappear somewhere else. Save the Children thinks it might be as much as a 6,000% increase in tourism destinations in recent years, thanks to volunteerism, uh, in places that Aussies like to go, Cambodia, Thailand, Bali, and Nepal. And surprise, surprise, in Nepal, it's no coincidence that many orphanages are concentrated in the areas where tourists go. So, with first-hand experience of this problem, Sunrise made a conscious effort not to become a part of that very tragic cycle. We still do have a residential children's home because there are still children who need a temporary safe haven, even if they're not orphans. We raised funds over several years to design and build a home in the hills about half an hour from Kathmandu. And we care for a varying number of children there who live in small family-sized groups while we work on relocating their families carefully, in reintegrating them wherever possible. And that can't be done in a hurry. Generally, they come to us when governments shut down illegal orphanages and they need somewhere safe as a transition home. With us, they attend the village school, which we also support financially. And if we can find relatives who care for them, then we begin that slow process of reintroduction, um, which hopefully learns, uh, leads to full return if all goes well. And of course, we monitor the family's progress afterwards, continue our support, and make sure all's going well. At the moment, I think we've got about 15 or 16 children in our residential home. That number doubled in May when the government shut down another illegal orphanage and brought 19 kids to us. Thankfully, since uh, as of about um, um, three weeks ago, we have reintegrated all but one of those children back to family members. And we'll continue to offer support for about three years while those children settle back in at home. In fact, since Sunrise began, we've managed to find families for around 120 of our kids. So that's about 85% of the children that have come our way. But by far the biggest part now of our operation is trying to prevent the separation of those kids in the first place. There are two parts to this. Our education scholarships, um, which is financial support for children to stay in school so they can afford their books and their uniforms and their parents don't have to send them out to the fields to work. Um, then there is the Family Livelihood Program, which is fairly new. It's instruction and support for small business ventures, microloans, financial counselling, so families themselves have their means to keep the kids at home. That program is in its infancy, it's in its early days, it's something we've only just started in our last round of programs. So it will take a while to be fully established, but I am pleased to report that uh, a goat breeding program is already well underway and very successful. Lots of kidding round. Sorry for the dad joke. <laughs> I don't want to be a killjoy and tell people not to volunteer overseas because there is so much good that can come from it. But what can we do? Well, clearly not short-term stints with orphanages that request huge amounts of money from unqualified volunteers to hang around with the kids. That should ring everyone's alarm bells. There's a very good Australian organisation called Rethink Orphanages, and they have a 10-point checklist for potential volunteers on their website. I'm happy to pass that website on later. Um, but basically, the checkpoints are this. Check that the needs have been set out by the local community themselves, that it's something that they really want and need. Check that it's sustainable, there's no local alternative. You don't want to compete with something that's already working there. It doesn't involve orphans or vulnerable children. There is a skills match with what they need and what you're offering. There's evidence of real impact. That you'll be safe, personally safe. That you're not being sold something. Lots of love and butterflies and happiness. And check their application process. You should be heavily vetted and interviewed 
and have all the police checks done. And if they're not asking for those things, they're, they're not asking the right questions themselves. Engineers, medical workers, builders, scientists can all continue to make huge contributions to legitimate overseas aid programs. And the various industry bodies are often quite good places to start looking and to start making inquiries. If you or your kids or your grandkids or anyone you know is thinking about wanting to make a contribution overseas. But ask yourself this, if you are not qualified to do it here in Australia, why should you be volunteering to do it in another country? What are you really offering? Thank you, Bryony. I'm sure you'll all agree she's shed a light on um, an aspect of our world that we are not necessarily we can't be proud of, uh, but nonetheless is there, and it's important that we uh, find out about these things and are able to discuss them and hopefully do something about them. Thank you, Bryony. Uh, please accept that certificate. Thank you very much. And thank you for talking to us today. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you.